Welcome to Carbon Connection, the podcast bringing you the latest insights from the front lines of climate action. I'm Lauren Knapphuk with the Climate Action Reserve, and together we'll hear from industry leaders driving real progress against climate change and explore the ever-evolving world of carbon markets and climate policy. Thanks for joining, and let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to yet another exciting episode of the Carbon Connection podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be covering a landmark policy that is critical for the U.S. to reach its climate goals and is the largest investment in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the country's history, the Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA. Today, I'm joined by the fantastic Christina Wyatt, who is the Deputy General Counsel and Chief Sustainability Officer at Persephone, a leading carbon management and accounting SaaS software company. Christina previously served as Senior Counsel for Climate and ESG to the Director of the Division of Corporation Finance at the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, where she led the drafting of proposed rules related to climate change disclosures. Prior to joining the SEC, She was a senior counsel and director of sustainability at Latham & Watkins LLP, where she developed and built the firm's sustainability program, co-chaired its ESG practice, and was a member of the firm's ESG steering committee. Needless to say, we are with a climate champion and advocate today, and together with Christina, we'll unpack what has been implemented under the IRA to date, the impact it can have, and why it is the most comprehensive federal climate legislation to be signed into law to date. Christina, thanks so much for joining me. Lauren, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all ours. And Christina, as you know, we briefly just covered, today we're covering the Inflation Reduction Act, which is crucial as it represents the largest investment in climate action in U.S. history. So I'm wondering if, to kick us off, can you provide an overview of the IRA and how it will contribute to the U.S. meeting its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets? So we're happy to. And it really is a key landmark piece of legislation. And just to quickly go over it, and there's a lot to it, but I'll give you some high points. So the main objectives of the act are to reduce the deficit to fight inflation, to lower energy costs and increase cleaner energy production, to reduce carbon emissions by approximately 40% by 2030, to lower healthcare costs and particularly prescription drug prices, and to improve equity in the tax system. So let me just lean into one of these areas in particular. One of the key areas of focus is on climate and energy. And the IRA invests $369 billion in energy security and climate change programs over the next 10 years. It provides tax incentives for clean energy production and manufacturing. It offers consumer incentives for energy efficient home improvements and electric vehicles. And finally, it aims to strengthen domestic supply chains for clean energy technologies. Thank you so much, Christina. That was such a fantastic overview of the IRA for us. And I think important as well as we in the climate field sometimes jump to the climate and energy benefits, but you've importantly highlighted that it's also covering health, equity, looking at reducing deficit, but knowing today we're going to really be covering these critical climate initiatives that the IRA is looking at as well. And On that topic, what are some of the specific programs and initiatives that have been implemented under the IRA so far, and what are their expected outcomes? Well, there are a lot of them, actually. So just to tick through a few, there are clean energy tax incentives. So the IRA enacted or created over 20 tax incentive programs for clean energy and manufacturing, including credits for renewable energy production, energy efficient home improvements, residential clean energy installations like rooftop solar arrays, electric vehicle purchases on EV infrastructure. There's also low income community bonus credit programs. These are programs that are aimed 
to drive clean energy investments in underserved communities. And applications have already been opened up and received for those programs. Similarly, there are rural electrification investments. So the Department of Agriculture has made over $1.3 billion available for agricultural producers and small rural businesses to finance clean energy investments. There have been climate resilience funding initiatives. So the administration has awarded over a billion dollars to help communities become more resilient to climate change impacts. There's a greenhouse gas reduction fund, and this program invests $15 billion in residential development and clean energy alternatives for low-income communities. There's an energy infrastructure reinvestment program, and that's a new loan program that supports the retooling, repowering, or replacement of energy infrastructure that ceased operations. So addressing those areas where traditional fossil fuels may be phased out to provide economic opportunity in those communities. And then finally, I would just touch on advanced energy project credit. So this extends a 30% investment tax credit to clean energy projects that strengthen domestic energy manufacturing. That is all so amazing to hear, Christina. I really appreciate you walking us through that as you're giving nod to the important tools that the program is setting up and they're doing it in conjunction with communities and especially looking at underserved communities who might not be able to support environmental initiatives without the power of the government supporting them. So thank you for raising this as it's an important piece to cover as part of the IRA. And you've covered these different programs and touched on different sectors and I'm wondering if we can dive a little bit deeper into that in what specific sectors or industries where the IRA has had a particularly noticeable impact in terms of emissions reductions or innovation. Sure. You know, there are a lot of them, and I'll just touch on a few of the sectors that either have already been significantly impacted or that are likely to be significantly impacted in the future. The first one that I would touch on is the electricity sector. A big part of the IRA has been focused on driving large increases in the development of renewable energy, including wind and solar energy. So clearly, the electricity sector is significantly impacted. The transportation sector will also be significantly impacted. The IRA provides incentives for electric vehicle purchases and the deployment of EV infrastructure. So I think we're gonna see much greater uptake of EV use throughout the economy over the coming years. There's energy efficiency in the built environment. The IRA provides tax credits for energy efficient home improvements, including insulation and efficient windows and doors and electric heat pumps. I think there will be a significant impact in the agriculture and forestry sectors. So the IRA includes provisions for updating farm and forestry practices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Relatedly, the Department of Agriculture has made available over $1.3 billion for agricultural producers and small rural businesses to finance clean energy investments. And then finally, I would just note the industrial sector. The act provides incentives to improve industrial efficiency and provides funding for clean energy alternatives in industry. So a lot of different sectors that will be impacted and that will be impacted significantly. Absolutely. I so appreciate you touching on each one of these sectors, electricity, transportation, built environment, and tying these together by expressing two, I think, mechanisms. Finance, the government is helping through tax incentives or tax credits, but then also technology innovation. So coupling these two to be able to improve emissions reductions throughout each of these sectors. And I, on a personal note, live in the state of Maine, and I've been able to even see that in my backyard, us having uptakes in EV centers only because of the IRA. So I think widespread us as Americans are really being able to see it tangibly, which you might not notice through other acts of legislation that get passed. So this is 
really strong and important. So thank you, yes. Christina. That's great. I'm glad to hear that. You've had this EV infrastructure in Maine. That's very cool. And it's only recently because of the IRA. So thank you for covering it and allowing me to highlight that as well. Of course. And taking that step back with the IRA. So we've now understood what's happening on the sector level, what's happening with communities. And relating it to what's happening globally with climate change, how does the IRA align with U.S. commitments to international climate agreements like the Paris Agreement, for example? Yeah, it's really critical. I think we don't really stand much of a chance of meeting our commitments without the IRA as a catalyst, as a boost. So the IRA is projected to reduce U.S. carbon emissions to about 35 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. And this represents a, a really substantial bit of progress toward the U.S.'s commitments under the Paris Agreement. Our commitment is to reduce emissions by 50% below 2005 levels by 2030. So the IRA itself won't get us all the way there, but it will help significantly move us in the right direction. So the IRA is estimated to reduce emissions by an additional six to 10 percentage points compared to baseline projections without the legislation. So it's an important piece of our progress, but of course it doesn't fully close the gap. So additional policies and actions are going to be needed to reach our 50% reduction goal. So it's definitely a huge step in the right direction. It's not everything, but it's a big step in the right direction. Absolutely. It's representing this progress towards our commitment. As we in the United States, we all know, play a pivotal role in honoring our progress towards emissions reductions as somebody that is one of the highest emitters in the world and doing our due diligence through the IRA and supporting that initiative thereby. And talking about these additional policies or players that might need to be involved to help us ramp up our commitment efforts. Could you discuss the role of the private sector and state governments in implementing IRA-funded programs? Sure, happy to. So they're both really critical. The, the states play a role really both directly and indirectly. They're going to be essential in creating and funding things like green banks to leverage IRA funding. And especially the $27 billion greenhouse gas reduction fund that will have to be implemented through the states. The states will pass legislation to streamline clean energy and transmission permitting processes. So, you know, there's some tension between the environmental permitting and the development of clean energy, renewable energy projects. And those two things are going to have to be harmonized. And the states are going to play a very important role there. The states will be important in expanding agency capacity to assist under-resourced communities, tribes, and environmental justice efforts with the IRA program money that's being made available. The states will also be important in establishing funds to provide matching grants, which are required by some of the IRA programs. They'll enact complementary clean energy policies, like 100% clean electricity mandates. So you can see that the states will play a really important role in the implementation and in the sort of foundational architecture that's going to need to be in place for the IRA money to actually have effect. Now, also, transparency laws like California's SB 253 and 261 are also going to be incredibly important. Specifically, SB 261 requires companies to talk about their climate-related risks and what they're doing about them. And the IRA, of course, provides important funding mechanisms that will contribute to companies' risk mitigation. So you can see the intersection between the state law and the IRA funding. And then, of course, at the private sector level, we'll see important activities by companies and individuals by applying for and using tax credits and incentives provided by the IRA, for example, clean energy projects, manufacturing, 
energy efficiency upgrades and the like. Thank you so much, Christina. You've really painted this wonderful picture of how hand in hand this IRA needs to be with states. And you use the term foundation architecture. That's what states are providing as the IRA is truly the framework for states to be able to enact these programs, find these matching grants, and giving California as that example of how they're going to be implementing these programs with IRA as a framework, but going forth on that state policy level is truly important for people to see in action. So thank you for raising these points. It's all so helpful. And looking at this relationship between the states and the federal government for climate policy, there is going to be long-term economic benefits felt by the American people that can be expected from the IRA. So I'm wondering if you can walk us through what some of these economic benefits that could be expected, both in terms of job creation and the growth of green industries that you've given nod to. Yeah, happy to. I mean, the long and short of it is that we expect huge job creation and we expect huge development of renewable infrastructure and other green infrastructure couple of specifics. So there's an estimate that I read that the IRA is projected to create more than 9 million jobs over the course of the next decade. So approximately a million jobs per year. And then just in terms of industries, over $70 billion in investments have been announced for the EV supply chain and $10 billion in investments for solar manufacturing. These are pretty big numbers. So I think we can expect to see huge investments in clean energy projects and huge job growth creation that will result from the IRA. Thank you, Christina. And 9 million jobs over the course of a decade is truly a phenomenal understanding of what the market can look like, especially for future generations that are entering the job market and Hopefully, as I think I like to believe, most of them are climate advocates. So being able to enter a job market that is also supporting new growth in the green industry is really inspiring, especially for this next generation of workers. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. And the other piece of this, of course, is the environmental justice piece and the critical importance of many of these jobs be earmarked for areas that are otherwise losing fossil fuel related jobs. So these people won't be left behind and addressing the issue of all of these jobs that are being lost, that have been lost and providing new opportunities for people who have been adversely impacted by the transition away from fossil fuels. Definitely. That's such an important note that you make as sometimes the criticism, let's say, that the green industry might face is that it's perhaps taking away jobs from people that have, for generations, worked in fossil fuel intensive industries. So to have this almost backup plan that they can look at as, you know, we're not looking to take your job away. We are looking to promote climate change initiatives that can also support new training that we can get folks back into as part of this green transition. So definitely an important note, and I appreciate you raising that. And on that note, as that is, we can think of a challenge for some individuals, what are other potential challenges or obstacles that might hinder the success of the IRA in achieving its climate goals? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get political here, but even though I think there's some tension around sort of the red state, blue state thing in that a lot of red states are really the beneficiaries of IRA money and are happily so and have said that they want to continue to reap the benefits of the IRA funding and the progress that they're making. At the same time, we need to continue down this path and continue to implement the IRA so that the money continues to flow to these states, to these projects. There have been statements that have been made by the Republican candidate for president that a new administration would likely significantly thwart progress through the IRA. And so 
that candidate is pledged to rescind any unspent IRA funds and change the tax credits and free spending. So, you know, I think a new administration would put a real question mark on how much progress we can expect to see. My hope is that whoever's in the White House that will continue to see progress under the IRA and that in particular these communities that are suffering will continue to reap the benefits of this new infusion of money to help them to prosper again. Thank you, Christina. Yes, absolutely agree. And something that we can definitely keep in mind is that whether you are a red state or blue state, climate change doesn't look at your boundary between your state and your neighbor. It's a national issue that we're all facing. So hopefully, collectively, we can move forward and continue to support the IRA, regardless of the outcome of this election, as it's one of the top tier issues of our time. And each American is feeling the impacts of climate change in their own way, regardless of what state you live in. So it's important to keep support of this program and ensure that these initiatives stay put together in conjunction between the federal and state government. So thank you for sharing. And I so appreciate you giving nod to the work on environmental justice around IRA. So I want to definitely highlight that a little bit more and ask you, what role does the IRA play in supporting environmental justice and ensuring that underserved communities are benefiting from climate action? Yeah, this is one of the really great things in the IRA is that it doesn't simply address climate change, which, you know, of course, is an enormous <laughs> issue unto itself, but it also does so in a way that thinks about the communities throughout our country and how to help them to prosper. And this is just absolutely critical, particularly as we think about environmental justice issues and the disproportionate impact that climate change can have on many of our underserved communities. And so the IRA has a lot of initiatives that are designed to not only address climate change, but to do so in an equitable way and in a way that can help those communities to prosper. Few examples on the IRA allocates $3 billion for environmental and climate justice blocks grants to support community-led projects in disadvantaged communities. And these grants aim to address disproportionate environmental and public health harms related to pollution and climate change. Absolutely critical and not something that we paid enough attention to in the past. So it's about time, honestly. And then there's a greenhouse gas reduction fund. So the EPA's $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is designated or designed to ensure that two-thirds of the funding flows to low-income and disadvantaged communities. So again, focusing not only on the environmental impacts, but also the social impacts of where that money is going. There's a Clean Energy and Sustainability Accelerator, which will prioritize over 50% of its investments in disadvantaged communities, supporting the deployment of zero emission technologies like heat pumps, community solar, and EV charging for those disadvantaged communities. And there are many more programs that are embedded or woven through the IRA that similarly look to address climate change, but also address some of the social issues that are just absolutely woven throughout our society. Yes. Thank you, Christina. That's such an important point to raise as having this focus on ensuring that no community is left behind and that a large portion of funding and eyes have been towards supporting disadvantaged communities. And it's exciting, of course, that funding is supporting things like heat pumps and EV infrastructure and solar, but taking that step back and understanding that Climate change is also a public health initiative that needs to be tackled. And the communities that are facing that the deepest are these disadvantaged communities. So making sure that we're focusing on promoting climate change initiatives that are also uplifting public health initiatives at the same time for disadvantaged communities is so important to raise. So thank you so much for those insights. Yeah, thank you. I, I totally agree. I think you put it really well. Thank you, Christina. And... Before we close today, I have really one last question that I'd like to kick over to you, which is 
future looking for the IRA and understanding your perspectives about how will the progress and impact of the IRA be monitored and assessed over time? And what are the key milestones that we need to hit to fully realize its goals? Yeah, it's a really good question. So how do we know if we're successful, right? So, I mean, I think our climate, we have a very concrete goal, which is to reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030 as against that 2005 baseline. So if we hit that, I think we can say that's success. And then there are other goals that are embedded within the IRA and economists and policymakers are going to be monitoring some economic indicators like inflation rates. Of course, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act. So it was designed as, you know, a mechanism to do many things, but not least of which is to manage inflation. So looking at inflation rates, looking at job creation and particularly job creation in underserved communities job creation in the clean energy sector, the development of clean energy, and particularly the development of clean energy as a percentage of our overall energy mix, overall economic growth. They'll be contributing factors to how we measure success. They won't stand on their own because they're, of course, impacted by many other factors. But I think that those are the types of factors that we're just going to have to look at to start to assess the progress that we're making. And then when we look back, say in 2030, and evaluate whether we've met our climate goals and met our inflation reduction goals, our job creation goals, our renewable energy production goals, I think we'll have some pretty good measuring sticks to use to evaluate our progress. Absolutely. They will definitely be serving as these measuring sticks and ensuring that we're, we're looking at all of these pieces. But it also comes back to without the Inflation Reduction Act, we wouldn't even be really thinking about these mechanisms for job creation or managing inflation in terms of how it relates to our energy sector, transportation, and all of these important tools for us to be meeting our climate goals. So a big thank you to the IRA for enabling us to even be tracking these types of metrics for the United States. So it's it's really exciting, especially being in the climate field, but having conversations externally with communities and seeing what's changing every single day around them because of the IRA. And I think, and I'm hopeful for the future of the U.S. in terms of these sectors. So I definitely appreciate all of your time, Christina, and enabling us to be hopeful about the future of the U.S. because of the IRA. And truly, thank you for your expertise and your time today. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's been such a pleasure. I really appreciate getting to spend the time with you. Likewise, Christina, and I'm sure we'll have some more in the future and we'll take this forward together. <laughs> Sounds great.